Okay, well, welcome everyone to another edition of uh, this Rencontre uh, Seminars. So today we have, I think it will be the last uh, talk this year. Uh, the talk will be by Gulvan Lerche. Uh, I hope I pronounced it well from uh, CERN. And Gulvan is going to be talking about fluxes, solomorphic anomalies, and elliptic genera in four dimensions. So Gulvan, just go ahead. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Actually, I was supposed to give a talk, I don't know, two years ago and last year. And then, then there was yeah, when coronavirus started, China, yeah. Now even only virtually, I, I managed to do it. So I'm gonna talk uh, about work done in collaboration with Sung Julie and uh, Willy Lockhart and Timo Weigand at that time uh, at CERN, but now, well, uh, Gulli is still there, but the other two left. And uh, somehow uh, we were working on, on the gravity conjectures and these kind of things. And then we were led back to very old stuff, uh, stuff uh, I was doing many years before. And uh, somehow uh, it links various different uh, areas of physical mathematics together, namely n equal one elliptic genera, elliptic genera of n equal one supersymmetric strings in four dimensions. Somehow you might think this is very simple and trivial because these are more or less the simplest elliptic genera you can imagine, but actually it's the opposite. So it was quite uh, quite uh, surprising what we found in, in complexity. So here's an, oh, oh, here's an overview of the talk. Uh, say the two thirds will be a review of things you know very well. Yeah, but there are many experts in, in the audience, so I hope I don't bore them, but I need this as a preparation for the second part where the new stuff is then explained. Uh, so first I will motivate a bit why we started to do this. Then I review how to compute elliptic genera non-perturbatively via dualities in six dimensions and, and mention holomorphic anomalies. And then uh, we come to four dimensions where the new feature are fluxes which makes the thing very complicated. And uh, there's a kind of relative form of written theory, which allows to compute the degeneracies. And, and then the modular properties are much worse than, than expected uh, from the past. Uh, so I will then explain those uh, and, and also point to a new kind of uh, holomorphic anomalies. So these are the main results. Um, <clears throat> so, the issues of mirror symmetry of Calabriau four faults in the presence of fluxes. And we need to have a U1 gauge theory, otherwise there is no elliptic genus in four dimensions to begin with. So that's very crucial. And the issue is the first issue to compute elliptic genera, possibly non-perturbative one via dualities. Non-perturbative means there could be extra heterotic, uh, sorry, NS5 brains in the game uh, and so on. Yeah. And then the observation was that these things are not modular, not even quasi-modular. They are much worse than this. In fact, they are derivative pieces appearing. And this leads to uh, a new kind of, namely, uh, a new kind of non-modularity, namely so-called quasi-Jacobi forms. And an example is this E1 of tau and Z. And the moment you have quasi-modularity in the game, you have also anomaly equations. And they point, or they're sensitive or probe in a way, a hidden six-dimensional sector, as I will explain later. And then I will also point out a few physics applications, namely it modifies the mechanism of anomaly cancellation, which was pioneered by, by, by Nick and Bertschelikens in the past. And then I say some, some words also about the gravity conjecture applications. So let's start uh, very broadly with a general motivation. Um, we now we have this, this, this conjectured consistent conditions, the gravity conjectures and so on. But as it's often the case in string theory, the, this, these conditions are miraculously satisfied due to some deep mathematical properties. Uh, so there are statements which are simple to state, but it boils down if you really go to the end uh, that the, the underlying mathematical structures which guarantee that these principles hold. For example, no global symmetries in quantum gravity is, is a dogma. And uh, so the idea is that if you say switch off a gauge coupling by going a long distance in the modular space, so that the gauge coupling becomes zero and the gauge symmetry wants to become global, there will be an asymptotically massless tower of states coming down, either Kaluza Klein or ten tensional strings to make sort of this corner ill-defined from the point of view of, of the active, effective action. And what is behind there is, uh, is a degeneration geometry of Calaveo manifolds. 
uh, which can be either complex structure, large complex structure or large volumes. And there's a mathematical classification of this. And that captures all these cases. Yeah. So, um, so, so in a way, these no global symmetries, this question is intrinsically tied, tied in this framework, of course, of Calabi-Yau compactifications with sort of degenerations of Calabi-Yau manifolds. Uh, another aspect or another dogma is there should be super extremal states in the theory with black holes into which extremal, state, uh, extremal black holes can decay. And that is guaranteed by the property of, of Jacobi forms or quasi Jacobi forms. And that goes back again to the modular properties of these manifolds uh, of these elliptic vibrations. So again, there's a mathematical principle or structure behind it such that everything works out in the end as expected. Oops, there's something missing here. How can this be? There are some pages missing. No, sorry. I, I transferred the file here from home. Let me see. Oh, the, the order was changed here. Fine. Okay, so we are still in, in good shape. So let's um, let's consider the simplest possible example, just just very naive. Yeah, namely. Can you, uh, can you put it full screen again? Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Thanks. Um, so, so we have some compactification, and then then we want to go to a regime where the gauge coupling becomes asymptotically zero, uh, while maintaining gravity, yeah, while keeping gravity in the game, yeah, not decoupling. This means we want to keep the Planck. Oh, where's the mouse arrow gone? That's not gone. This is that's not nice. How can this be? Sorry, I need to get out here. Here's the mouse arrow play. Anyway, so I have to go on somehow with this. So in the middle, you see the Planck scale has to be has to stay constant, and then um, this requires that the volume of this base manifold of a vibration must be constant. On the other hand, the coupling corresponds to some two sphere going to large size, so that the coupling vanishes. But the condition that this overall volume of this manifold, the submanifold stays constant, implies that another dual curve shrinks to zero size. So there's a, a vanishing curve CC naught. And the moment something shrinks to zero size, then you get, of course, some kind of uh, massless states. And the upshot is that whenever you go to the coupling limit, you have um, either Kaluza Klein excitations or solid stone extreme become tangentless asymptotically, which um, then uh, invalidates uh, the, the notion of the effective action in, in, in the point at infinity. This is of course exactly what, what a, one of the most original um, papers in, 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 in this field were, were postulating, where um, of course only the torus compactifications were considered, but here it is also true for general Calabi-O manifolds and it's, it is these mathematical theorems uh, about the generations of, of la uh, large complex structures, of vibration structures in the infinity, of this SYC vibrations and so on, uh, which guarantee th this outcome. And another thing one could check, of course, is whether something bad happens. For example, can there be a situation that two different string theories simultaneously become tensionless uh, or higher dimensional brains become tensionless? Or do we find a new weakly coupled theory of quantum gravity, which wasn't there before? For example, if we wouldn't have known the heterotic string, we would have found it in this way. Yeah? So in fact, one can show that given all this, this mathematical input that these special situations cannot happen. Yeah? So this is something we call the emergent string conjecture, which states, if we go to large distance, then only two things can happen. Either the theory decompactifies and we get a colored Klein spectrum or one of the known weakly coupled uh, strings, well, solitonic strings, but in a dual frame, weakly coupled emerge. Now, uh, let's go to a framework uh, where we want to do the computation, namely uh, F-theory. And um, so everybody knows uh, that F-theory is a fictitious 12-dimensional uh, theory, which is compactified on some elliptic fibered Calabi-Yau space. We consider uh, three and four volts here. 
And of course, we know we have a base manifold uh, and, and the elliptic fiber can degenerate over certain loci, which correspond to seven brain locations. But we can have also a curve, C0, a two cycle shrinking in certain regions. And a three, D3 brain can wrap around it. And if this C0 shrinks to zero volume, then we expect, of course, massless states and in particular massless tensile strings. And in six dimensions, this is very well known and it's worked out. It depends on the self-intersection properties of this curve, what happens. If it's negative, then we have a singularity in the finest distance of the moduli space, which gives rise to tensionless non-critical strings without gravity. But if, if it's larger than zero equals zero, then, then these singularities must be at infinite distance in the moduli space. And the self-intersection zero case corresponds to solid, solid only heterotic strings, critical strings. And uh, now we want to investigate the properties of these objects. Of course, you could ask, why don't we start in the first place with heterotic strings? The, the point is that we get here really non-perturbative um, setups. Yeah, we get, uh, we will compute the generis, uh, elliptic genera and so on for, for really non-perturbative non situations. So uh, as we, as well known, the elliptic genus, which was introduced first by, by, by Bert, uh, by, by, by Nick and Bert in, in 1986. Uh, uh, it wasn't called elliptic genus, but it was called Ramahomo partition function, but, but it is after all just the loop space index of the Dirac-Ramon operator. And it encodes robust information, essentially deformation invariant of a deformation invariant information about the subsector of the theory and underlies also the green schwarz anomaly consideration. What we will be doing here is considering 0 to sigma models. Yeah? So heterotic type of world sheets here with a single left moving U1 charge Q. Yeah? And I should point out this U1 is not an R symmetry yeah? because we don't have a left moving super symmetry to begin with. It's an, another U1 we pick and we need to pick it, otherwise we don't have nice anomaly, uh, anomalies to investigate. Huh? So um, as such, uh, this has an uh, expansion in terms of degeneracies. Uh, sorry, Wolfgang, uh, somehow I didn't understand. Yes. Where is this U1 coming from? The left or the right or the none? The right is a supersymmetric sector. Yes. Also On the left, um, we can have whatever gauge groups. And okay. we design it, and if we design the geometry, this is just a U1. So this U1 comes from the non-supersymmetric part? Right. Okay. Not an R symmetry. Um, now I'm really irritated that my mouse disappeared. Um, how uh, can I possibly restore it? Um, it never happened to me before. This is awful. I think, um, you know, what is it? Um, Keynote has this bu bug in it, but if you move, move the mouse, I think the mouse appears sometimes if you're lucky. Otherwise you have to reset a preference somewhere. Just try moving the mouse. Yeah, but it doesn't appear. I tried oh. Yeah, this makes it a bit more cumbersome because finger pointing doesn't help here. So, um, so this is the structure everybody knows and actually the, 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 the modular weight of this function is, is negative. Yeah. Um, so minus two in, in six dimensions, minus one in four dimensions. And now we want to compute it with geometry. And here one makes use of uh, F uh, and M theory duality. So um, on the left-hand side, well, we use the fact, of course, that we have an elliptic vibration, elliptic threefold. And in the left side, we consider uh, the six dimension theory compactified on an S1. And there are quantum numbers, namely the wrapping number, k, k momentum n, u1 charge r. In the dual m theory, this maps to a BPS particle in five dimensions, and the same states arise from m2 brains wrapped on around curves. And these curves are linear combination of this basic curve, C0. This is what we want to shrink to zero size. Then they ha have some n components in the elliptic fiber and r components of some other auxiliary. Um, curve which we need to define the U1. So in this way, we map um, this original problem to a mirror symmetry problem because um, this the right hand side, these 
these PPS numbers can be easily computed. And the upshot is that the six dimensional elliptic genus essentially is given by uh, the n equal to four dimensional prepotential. However, not generic, but it's a relative version, namely, it's relative to the curve C naught. That's why one talks also about the relative PPS invariance. You know, uh, they are defined, sort of C naught defines a frame, and we consider only curves uh, of these uh, linear combinations. So that would be the elliptic genus of this theory. And we know also that it has, uh, the elliptic genus is not only modular, but it has, it has also this extra U1. So it has a double periodicity. So it must be a Jacobi form. And by definition, um, Jacobi forms have these transformation properties, modular transformations, double periodicity. And as such, they have not only modular rate, but also an index. The index is an integer. And um, it's defined by a topological intersection number with a quantity, with a height pairing, which is defined to be there, which just is, it arises from the very definition of this U1. Yeah? So you have a geometric definition of this U1 appearing, and that determines the index of this Jacobi form, which is, in, in a sense, the Katsumudi level of, the, of this U1. Yeah? So it's known then then the, the, the ring of Jacobi forms is finitely generated. Therefore, one needs to fix only a few finite number uh, numbers by, by mirror symmetry computations and can compute the exact expression. Sorry, Wolfgang, what is this yes. B appearing in the formula for the index? I B is space time. So in the middle of the page, one minus D halves? No, no, the B in the in the index, one half C0 dot B. What is B? Yeah, B is a height pairing. This is this is a, a divisor which which is needed to define the U the one uh, in the theory. Nice. So in, uh, in order to do geometric engineer U ones in F theory, you need to have a special geometric structure, shoulder map and these kind of things, model Y groups, and and that that is a quantity and the intersection of this one with C naught determines uh, the index. I see. Thank you. And um, so this is a simple example. I just review this, everybody has, of you has, has been doing these computations. So we get this example for uh, separation of a Herzebruch surface, blah, 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 with some background gauge field Z. And when we switch it off, it maps back to the very well known genus of the heterotic string on K3, namely, which is given by E4, E6 over N to 24. So this is the elliptic genus of a solitonic string, which arises in a certain limit in the f theory compactification. Yeah? So this is standard perturbative, um, uh, fine, uh, and uh, the minus 480 is 20 times the Euler number and, and so on. So this is very, very long. So there's a little use of it already. Elliptic genus is a Jacobi form and as such it has this theta expansion. So it can be written by in terms of coefficients times theta functions. And these theta functions more or less are by definitions partition functions of a free boson. And as such, it has a certain built-in relationship between charge and excitation numbers, which may be called spectral flow, which also mirrors the fact that these coefficients, the expansion coefficient C, just depend only essentially on the discriminant. Discriminant is this uh, value here for mn minus r square. So it depends on the, on the excitation level and the charge. And therefore, if we plot the spectrum, it has this kind of structure on the horizontal axis, we have the excitation number, on the vertical, we have the charge, and dots with the same color are in the same spectral flow orbit. Uh, and then one can distinguish Jacobi forms, whether the states are larger than zero and, and, and so on, and you know this very well. Now the application in this context, in, in this context of the gravity conjectures, is as follows. Um, uh, there was a statement that super extremal states must exist for uh, black holes to be, being able to decay. Um, so there should not be a, a massive remnants. Now, if we take an example here, and which works for all these, these theories, of course, and plot the spectrum, then we can first of all look to certain subsets of states, namely, first of all, the ones which have vanishing discriminant delta equals zero. These correspond to maximally super extremal states they don't have a smooth horizon as black holes if we go out very far to the right to, to, to a large excitation number. There one would expect generically that these states will, will, will gradually turn into black holes, but these states don't. The blue line 
are the extremal states which can turn into extremal black holes asymptotically. So in fact, uh, the red line or the red dots are exactly the super extremal states one is looking for, which are postulated. Actually, they also must lie on a lattice that must have equal spacing in order to make compactific further compactification on S1s uh, consistent. And this is exactly what is reproduced here. And uh, it is just the underlying properties of the Jacobi forms which guarantees this. This is just an intrinsic property. So, but if we come really from a Calabiao geometry, fourfold, duality, uh, and so on, then in the end, we always find this pattern just because of the built in mathematics work exactly in the expected way. Yeah. Now, I should note that these pictures have been investigated quite a lot by, by the black hole people, by many of you. They are one usually considered spinning black holes, which is a bit different. Uh, so uh, they in particular have so-called polar states where delta is less, smaller than zero. They don't appear in this context here. So this situation is simpler. Now uh, let's go on and, and consider a, a slightly different example, a non-perturbative uh, example where actually in the elliptic genus we have this quasi-modular function E2 showing up here, shown in red. And if you switch off now the gauge field, it turns out, uh, it turns in, into some elliptic genus of K3, which is not the normal one. It has not minus 480, but it has just minus 420 as mass for the massless states. And that is due to some small instanton NS5 brain transition, which give extra massless states. In particular, one has an extra massless tensor field, which is not perturbative. And therefore, this elliptic genus of K3 is not the one one usually calls elliptic genus of K3 because that's only defined perturbatively. Now there's an interpretation of this, which is very nice. Namely, the moment E2 appears, uh, the, the theory is not really modular, it's only quadimodular. It has this modular anomaly shown in red. And it's also known that this piece can be remedied by adding an almost holomorphic variant uh, to it, a mildly non-holomorphic in tau piece. And to my knowledge, the first colleagues who introduced this in physics was also Nick and Bert in the, back in 87, I think. And now the physics interpretation is that this is not just a random ad hoc procedure to, to, to make a sick theory uh, healthy, but it's really coming from a different sector in the past integral, namely there's a non-compact branch in the, in the geometry, which has zero modes, which gives the rise to the im tau, so that the total pass integral, the total partition function actually is rendered invariant uh, under this modular completion. Yeah. So there's a physics interpretation of this in tau. And uh, this can, uh, so this can be detected by, for example, can be visualized, for example, by this Horaupas Witten type of setup where we have two nine brains, end of the world brains, uh, and then the heterotic string stretches between them yeah, from left to right. But if you have an extra M5 brain in the game, this is what we have here then the heterotic string can split into two E strings. Yeah, this is sort of the incarnation of this famous idea, H is E plus E, namely that a heterotic string can be thought as bound state of two E strings. And now there's a degree of freedom, namely the E strings can slide here or vertically on the five brain sort of pictorially. And this zero mode is the one which gives rise to this M tau in this case. Uh, and, sorry, Golfan. Yeah. I never heard of these uh, E-strings. Well, can you say something else about them? Or? Okay, so um, in the beginning I was saying one can get also other strings, namely by, by cur shrinking curves of safe intersection min uh, negative. This gives tangential strings, but these are objects which are not perturbative. They don't have gravity. Uh, they, they are related to this uh, six-dimensional, five-dimensional superconformal fixed points. Mm -hmm. And um, th there was a paper by, by Baba Krakikat, Guli Lockhart, and Kumun Waffa, who made this very explicit uh, by, by showing that indeed uh, the heterotic stream can be viewed as a, a bound state of two E strings in the sense of the partition functions factorized in this way. So on the bottom, I have, I have sort of shown a version of the holomorphic anomaly equation, we can take a derivative with regard to E2, which is the same because E2 always comes with in tau together. We can also do an anti-holomorphic derivative to this holomorphic anomaly. 
that turns into the square of the partition function of the E strings. So in this sense, uh, the holomorphic anomaly precisely probes this bound state nature. And that was also pretty much anticipated, or you know, this was already shown in, in the paper by Mindanam, Meshansky, Waffe Warner. Nick is already switching on his screen. Maybe I'm just going to interpret a comment about E strings, you know, in the usual way that a heterotic string can be thought of as just taking a five brain and wrapping it around a K3, give you the heterotic string. You can then get the E string by taking a del pezzo surface, which is a half of K3 in yeah. a very real sense, and yeah. wrapping a five brain around that. And then once you realize that literally that the del pezzo is a half of K3, it makes this idea that there's a bound state when you glue two, two del pezzos into a, into a K3. Yeah. So it's another way of thinking about this process. Yeah. This is of course related to this picture here. Yeah, yeah the, absolutely. The, the pezzo. Okay. Oh, thank you, guys. But an E string is not that deep a thing. It's simply you just collapse a del pezzo with a five brain wrapped around it, and that's the tension of string you get. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. So now what do we do? Yeah, now this was easy part. Now this was review. Now we come to the new stuff, namely any one in four dimensions. And there we consider F theory on a fourfold. Again, where a suitable curve C not shrinks, but we need also a non zero background for flux. Otherwise, we don't have a chiral theory to begin with. So we put the flux, and as I will explain in a moment, the chrome of Witten invariance on color before faults are intrinsically defined in terms of this flux. Without flux, you cannot define chrome of Witten invariance, roughly speaking. So, whatever we compute as for elliptic genus or partition function, the expansion coefficients or degeneracies will have a label G4 on them. Uh, and if there are several fluxes, then we have several directions to go. It has modular weight minus one um, in four dimensions, and that is an odd function, odd Jacobi form, so that vanishes if you don't have a background field. And that is related to the fact that here on the, on the right hand side, there's a Green Schwartz mechanism depicted, and the Green Schwartz term is proportional to, to trace f, the f from the left, and that vanishes if it's not an abelian gauge symmetry. So we need a u1 very, very intrinsically in this game. So um, some more mathematical words on Grimov-Witten invariants on four folds. So generally, Grimov-Witten invariants are count stable maps from Riemann surfaces with, with punctures. Uh, and I should put an n here in, into the H2 of, of, of the Calabria K fold, subject to certain incidence relations. This means, uh, depending on what you want to do, um, there must, punctures of this human surface must map to certain cycles in, 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 in the Calabria. And the virtual dimension of the modular space of such maps means the expected naive dimension is given by this formula. Now, um, if, if you neglect the n here, then the z for three folds, there's no constraint. This is just zero, and, and that means we can just count Kromo Wittmanns as, as they are. But for four folds, for genus zero, the, uh, the, uh, the, there's a non vanishing number, namely one on the right hand side. So this means we need at least one insertion. Uh, and that means um, it translates into exactly uh, the flux background. So loosely speaking, these invariants are only defined by attaching these, these two cycles uh, to, to the background flux. Yeah. Also, it means there are no invariants for genomes larger than one. So as a side comment, this is a stupid comment, uh, but everybody asks then why, why color be a four foot is complicated? Why, why are there no high genus invariants? First of all, there's no mathematical way to define them, but in physics, you could ask the following question. For n equal two, the higher FGs, the higher invariants are related to higher terms in higher F terms, the gravity photon couplings and so on. So there, there's, a, there's a place in the FET action where these invariants can, can play the role of BPS invariants. But for any one in four dimension, there are no BPS invariants of this sort. Uh, Supersymmetry is not rich enough. Yeah, and that just is consistent with the fact that there are no FG invariants for, for four folds to define uh, in the first place. Okay, now these, these invariants are computable via mirror symmetry. Um, 
sorry, I've gone a little confused by this argument about the virtual dimension. So if you yes. if you put k equals four uh, and g equals zero, you get n plus one on the right hand side. Why do you say that you need no. n equals to one to make this? Well, on. n equals zero, we can always put more, but at least the modular the, the dimension of modular space is at least one, and therefore one has to put something to integrate against. Uh, yeah, you must define some some virtual cycle to integrate. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to put something. You have to define something to integrate. Otherwise, uh, well, you, you, have, you have sort of a modular space with no. But do you mean then g equals zero? Because it's for g equals zero that you would get n. Right. For, sorry, for g equals zero. You, uh, so for g equal one, uh, you get for g equal one. You don't get anything. Forget the n on, on the right hand side for g is one. There's nothing, so there are no constraints. So, uh, so whatever will come out from here, uh, there are new, there are new, 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 uh, new features expected for genus one. It's only a genus zero. Yeah, I wonder whether the plus n should be minus n in such a way that you get zero for uh, oh. for no, the dimension of the space, and then uh, right. then you must subtract it by doing integrals. I think that is the right formula. Okay. So, so, um, so in a way, one needs less to do um, because there are more FGs. And one can compute them, say, in genus zero um, by mirror symmetry. And um, so, uh, too bad with the mouse. Yeah. Down on the left hand side, there is sort of the complex structure type of object. And we consider here, say, type two A strings on this fourfold gives a two dimensional theory. So it's a two-dimensional prepotential or actually superpotential more appropriately. And uh, it involves the Joe four flux and the holomorphic four form. This is this um, group of alpha witten business. You get a prepotential here, but um, by mirror symmetry, um, uh, I should say before the, the, the flux, the four flux splits into horizontal, vertical, and, and neither nor pieces. And the vertical piece is defined by Wedging together one one forms, so you have two, two, two forms by squaring a one one form. And the horizontal piece is by vari variation of the holomorphic four form so this way. And these pieces are exchanged on mirror symmetry. So the prepotential, which can be computed geometrically on the down left side, is then equated to some kind of instanton expansion. Yeah involving the coefficients we are interested in, the degeneracies and um, labeled by the flux, of course. Uh, so that's the way how to compute them. Um, this, this was pioneered by, by Peter Meyer and, and then Clem, Lian, Rao, Yao, and, 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 and many others. Now, the point is, if we are, have elliptic fourfolds, and this is what we have, there's extra structure, First of all, uh, a priori, what we were talking about were type two A strings on, in, in, uh, on Calabria four folds compacted to two dimensions. We want to lift it to four dimensions. Yeah? We want to consider F theory in these Calabria four folds. And it turns out that not all fluxes can be lifted in the Lorentz invariant way to four dimensions. And because we have this elliptic structure in here, we have also extra quantum numbers, and it turns out that the partition functions will have a variety of different modular ways depending on the flux sector. So that was pointed out first by, by Hagihat and, and, and Yao and collaborators, and, and then later um, by Kota, Clem, and Schimanek. And uh, the idea is now to first choose a suitable basis of fluxes, which is sort of aligned with the modularity. So we split H to two into uh, zero minus one and minus two piece, and they label the modular weight of the corresponding partition functions. So if you take this, this invariance N and label them as fluxes, then depending on the flux sector, the partition function has weight um, given by W as indicated. Now, only the minus one fluxes can be lifted to four dimensions where then they play the role of an elliptic genus. And it, indeed, uh, we know that the elliptic genus in, in four dimension has weight minus one. So that fits together. And that is also intrinsically tied to a U1 symmetry 
is not a one symmetry that's empty. Now the role of the other uh, flux partition functions are just prepotentials in, in, in superpotentials, two dimensions without and four dimensional or immediate four dimensional interpretation. Now, now the interesting story. So if you go and, and, and make some sample geometry and, and, and some determine some curve C0, you want to shrink at last distance in the moduli space and, and then giving a, a general uh, four flux background and compute the invariance and you compute this elliptic genus with supposed modular weight minus one, then you find that it's not modular and also not quasi-modular because there's an extra piece, which is a derivative piece, which spoils modularity and double periodicity. So it's a derivative of another function, which has modular weight minus two. And if you look down, um, derivatives, of course, always spoil uh, gauge invariances. Yeah? If something is field dependent, so derivative is, is with respect to tau, which is a bottom derivative, q dq, yeah? produces the well-known E2 piece for modular forms, but if you have Jacobi forms, there are extra contributions, in particular that this function E1 appears. So E2 is a very well-known connection in the theory of modular forms. It's given by the derivative of log eta. E1 is an, an analog of this, which plays a role for Jacobi forms, which is given by the derivative of log theta. And as such, it has a minus one over z pole. So this is a meromorphic forms. You might be sort of worrying, uh, you know, what are the poles doing here? But effect, in effect, if you look to these equations above, um, the poles always cancel out. Now, that's why you have inverse uh, uh, Jacobi forms in the first terms. Yeah. The second equation, for example, has a minus one over two, right? minus one, one over z two, uh, one over z square pole and a one over z pole, they're all canceled by these various terms. It must be so because the left-hand sides of these equations, it, uh, the function of which you take derivatives have no poles to, to begin with. So you have a complicated structure. And- um, well, Wolfgang, can I ask, what, what yes? is the, this minus one and minus two on top of the fluxes that you're laying? It's laying? a modular weight. Ah, thank you. Sure. Okay. That's, that's a sector of the modular weight. Good. But geometrically, what does it mean? How do you, yeah, can okay. you tell? So, so this is what we have worked on our paper. Um, if you have certain classes of models, like like uh, elliptic vibrations over 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 some P three or, or um, um, other manifolds, uh, nested Hirzebruch surfaces, whatever, um, then you can give a precise definition of what the fluxes are as element of H22 geometrically. So you have certain divisors and pullbacks and blah, blah, blah. So you can make a list and tell uh, here and there, this flux must have modular weight minus one, minus, uh, minus two or zero. Yeah. Can, can I just sort of follow up? I mean, I'm used to the fact that fluxes typically have modulo eights minus one because of, you know, just that it inherits volume forms, volume terms from the torus. How do you get a modulo weight of minus two and, and presumably higher? I, I can tell you um, in the end, th th there's interpretation for this. Okay, thanks. So you, you get this, this, this messed up structure. And um, so, so we see, roughly speaking, that the, the elliptic general and four dimension lie in this ring. The new ingredient is the E1. But uh, since it's meromorphic has uh, one over z pole, there's also an implicit understanding that you need to divide it out by, by this finest, uh, by, by this well-known ordinary Jacobi form with, made, with negative weight in order to, to cancel these poles because they start with, um, they're proportional to c or z square or whatever. And so, so that, that's the structure. And as before, one can restore modularity by putting in sort of mildly non-holomorphic pieces. So the one over m tau is clear. And for the E1, you take mz over m tau. And it turns out that these transform nicely then under modular transformations. And that gives rise to, in analogy to, to almost modular forms or, or almost holomorphic uh, modular forms. Now we have almost holomorphic Jacobi forms. 
you, you assume you have a form which is modular invariant or it's a Jacobi form, the phi hat, then you expand it and then you have a finite number of terms with this in taus or in z's. And the maximal power to which this appears is called the depth. And by definition is the term which is independent of these, namely the holomorphic or the, the meromorphic piece is a quasi Jacobi form, yeah, which extends the notion of a quasi modular form. So the elliptic, elliptic genera are then just as a general, the physical partition functions are in general functions of these. Now, uh, now this, this strange thing now is, and this is now where it's really becoming uh, funny, is uh, now that these derivatives act between different flux sectors. So let's start again with elliptic genus with this extra red derivative piece of a partition function of flux minus two. And then we can also make it modular again by just replacing this derivative by a, uh, by a, by a covariant derivative, which is just amounts to replacing E1 by, by E1 hat. Uh -huh. And then you can concisely uh, write down an elliptic holomorphic anomaly equation, where on the left-hand side, we have this elliptic genus we talk about, which is modular weight minus one, but the output of this variation is a partition function of weight minus two. Uh -huh. So a priori, this is puzzling, so why would it be there? Uh, very strange. Um, but in fact, it's an expression of a mathematically recognized properties of relative chromophyte invariants for fourfolds or n-folds in general. And there were Oberdick and Pixton were writing some pioneering papers in, in the mass literature. And this is a very general uh, phenomenon and does not only apply to modular weight minus one elliptic general, but for example, also weight zero. For example, if you take a tau derivative, or actually a tau bar, an anti-holomorphic derivative, of a weight zero function, then you also generate the minus two. Yeah. Of course, these are not elliptic genera, but these are just partition functions in two dimensions. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, that, that works similarly. So we have an algebra of anomalies. So we have three kinds of fluxes, weight zero, minus one, and minus two. Generically, all of them figure as prepotentials in two dimensions. But the minus one can also be lifted to the elliptic genus in four dimensions. And the minus two can be viewed, as I will say in a moment, as an elliptic genus in six dimensions. And uh, then there are derivatives, either the tau or the z or the other direction, del e1 or del e2, or the non-holomorphic variants, which map between them. And now uh, all this was mass, so this was a mathematical property, but of course, I mean, where is it coming from? And we know very well that holomorphic anomalies were first of all invented or discovered by Rafa et co, in particular in this famous BCOV paper in 93, where they did the following, they considered topological strings and investigated the decoupling of anti-holomorphic perturbations. Yeah. So naively, these correlation functions should be independent of anti-holomorphic deformations, but they can be contact terms and they give rise to this, uh, to this extra contributions and to non-trivial holomorphic anomaly equations. So what we were doing, we were repeating this computation for four folds uh, and there is now a new extra term. Yeah? So on the left-hand side, in the picture below, we start roughly speaking with a partition function in flux sector A related to some curve C beta, it takes the anti-holomorphic derivative and the first term, the first quadratic term on the right hand side is a usual story. Namely, if C beta is reducible, then it can split into two and that, that gives rise to this ordinary holomorphic anomaly equation, which has this quadratic feature. And that again mirrors what, what Nick was saying before in, in the appropriate geometric setup, this mirrors or this somehow is, yeah, expresses the, in the suitable setup, there's the splitting of the heterotic string into two E strings. That's the same, same kind of anomaly here. But there's an extra term, namely, we have also a flux vertex operator insertion. And if the anti-holomorphic anti derivative hits now this flux operator, there's a contact term, but it has not charge zero as before and disappears, but now it's another charge one operator. And actually it turns out to be a gravitational descendant operator, which has 
well, it can be written as a double derivative of the Dilaton profile on the world sheet as a comment. So it's a new term for four folds, and this is a term which, which makes all the difference here. Yeah? And this equation is the most general one that encodes both modular and elliptic anomalies. At this point, people sometimes ask, what, what is for genus one? This was for genus zero. For genus one, nothing changes as compared to the usual story. Yeah? So this term appears only for, for genus zero. Okay, now, now, now come, come, we come into shaky waters here. Um, so can we have a physical interpretation in space-time? Um, so in sixth dimension, we knew that this in the holomorphic anomaly equation, the, the splitting quadratic term detects non-holomorphic zero modes uh, in the binding of two E-strings. Yeah? So we have an anti-holomorphic derivative and it gives the square of the partition function of E-strings. Now the question is, is there a similar meaning or uh, which underlies the extra piece in the holomorphic anomaly? Now here we had to be a bit more speculative because yeah, this is a different ballpark of, of problems. But one can argue that if you dualize the flux in, in terms of an NS5 brain and then make use of the fa fact that when strings hit in his uh, five brains, there can be zero modes, uh, similar to what was known in the, in the situation before. And one can play around with this and find uh, there is a modular space, a component of the modular space, which is funny enough, a certain threefold. And I have depicted um, here on the right hand side, a picture, uh, the kind of geometric setup. Uh, the whole thing is a fourfold with elliptic fiber, then the base B3, has a structure, the, the vertical thing, uh, yeah, the C0 is the curve which rings, and the threefold Y3 is sort of the, shown by the bracket on the, on the left. Now you, you, you see with your eye what the definition of this threefold is. And in the situation when this is Calabria itself, which is not always the case, then the extra piece on the right hand side of the holomorphic anomaly equation is the elliptic genus of this one, of this threefold. And it has modular weight minus two, which is appropriate for elliptic genus, heterotic uh, elliptic genus on a, on a threefold. So it's a, a, a appropriate modular weight for elliptic genus in a fictitious six dimension theory. So, so the speculation is that in a, in a way which needs to be made precise still, uh, that there are zero modes which are localized on, on this Y3. And it's complicated, and I just remind you, there was this paper by Murti and Witten in spring on, or was it last year? Probably last year. Um, showing how, how holomorphic anomalies say, say in Elke for your mystery uh, and so on, really appear by, uh, well, if you really study the world sheet Sigma models and, and uh, take the zero modes very careful, then you find uh, these holomorphic anomalies. And some kind of computation of this sort needs, would need to be done here to, to confirm this. It was double car put off uh, written, I think, mm -hmm. what you have in mind. Mm, it may be a bit a big mistake. Yeah, maybe. But there was also the paper of Murti and Witten. I don't remember now what, it, what this was about. I thought it was this one. Anyway, there are, there's a sequence of papers focusing on this problem. And, and this one is probably a variant of this problem. Um, having to do that, that, that uh, there's a non-compact branch with a boundary and the boundary is this Y3. Uh, this, this, this is the logic. But I don't want to put more words in here because it's shaky grounds. But one, what one can say is also, um, if the elliptic genus has this strange form and has extra terms which were not known before, I mean, it should also influence anomaly cancellation. Yeah, it should mess it up in a way. And the point is that this geometry implies that there are extra massless states. And uh, so the anomaly cancellation needs to take care of them. And this is exactly what this extra term is doing. So that, that, that is very perfectly consistent. Um, with expectations. Now, step back to the gravity conjecture. This is also a bit roughly, this is more heuristic type of um, um, chain of thoughts. 
So we saw the elliptic twin has this form, uh, a normal modular, quasi-modular form, and, and then an, uh, this derivative piece. The left piece is a Jacobi form of odd weight. So it vanishes, it's odd in, in, in Z, in the gauge field. It vanishes if Z is equal to zero. And that translates that these maximal super extremal states don't exist. They, they don't contribute here in the elliptic genus. So there are holes here. But there would, would be needed in order for the sublattice conjecture uh, would be would be true. So there's no lattice, and that's a slight variation, uh, slight variation of, of expectations. Also, somehow there are many gaps, and this is a bit pretty sparse spectrum. So so this this somehow is a bit in contradiction to expectations from these weak gravity conjectures. However, and, and there should be caveats. The caveat is of course. We talk about index here, so there can be cancellations and the states can be there. Also, in many related contexts, uh, the states, these kind of indices count are actually real degeneracies. Um, but I don't know. Yeah? So, but a priori, it doesn't mean that these states are not there. And also, for these arguments, um, of course, the quantum corrections would be important. Yeah? Yeah, so, this, this is sort of mandatory weak coupling, but um, especially if it's so little supersymmetry as quantum correction should be more important. So one, so if this picture is not what one expects, then it doesn't really mean, it doesn't imply that the theory is inconsistent. Yeah. On the other hand, the extra piece supplements all these missing states because it's not a Jacobi form anymore. It's a messed up Jacobi form. So that, that would restore all the spectrum, but it's also a fishy argument because these pieces are independent. So one can always find a flux where the derivative piece disappears and then, then we are back to the problem on the left-hand side. But this is simply all comments I can make in this context uh, coming from the elliptic channel. Okay, let's come uh, to the summary conclusions. So elliptic channel four dimensions known since the mid-late 80s. Um, have surprisingly complex features. One, we step out of perturbative heterotic strings. Once we consider solitonic strings arising or emergent in, in long distance limit in F-theory. And in order to have anything to talk about, we need a, a, a non-trivial U1. And uh, for those, uh, all properties depend crucially on the four fluxes. And then can compute this elliptic general by, by combining methods of of mirror symmetry on four folds with, with string dualities. Uh, and then um, everything depends on relative chromophyte invariants, relative with, re with respect to these curves, the string to zero size, and define the string in the, in the, in the first place. And um, the surprising thing is that parts of the elliptic genera are given by Z derivatives of partition functions correspond to white minus two sectors. And formally, at least in some cases, when, when these manifolds y are calabi out, these are really the six dimensional elliptic genera. So there's a hidden six dimensional structure in the game which contributes. And uh, just more mathematically speaking, there's a new type of holomorphic anomalies in, in, in these in this, uh, theories. It's, it's more than just having the C variable besides the tau variable, but the nature of the terms of the holomorphic anomaly equation, namely in particular the gravitation descendant term, is really a generally new type of uh, structure. Yeah. And uh, as physics applications, well, one can try to make more contact with the uh, gravity conjectures, at least um, I pointed out a fishy way. And, and then also a concrete uh, application is um, uh, how does anomaly cancellation work now for these more general theories? That's all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Wolfgang. OK, many virtual clapping here. Good. So we had some questions uh, during the talk, but uh, there's plenty of time for more questions. So I'm a bit pressed because I have to leave. Um, oh, OK. So, yeah. Sure. Well, I have one quick question. Maybe you said it in your talk, but I, I did not understand it. What is the relation between the selective genera and, and the F terms in the low energy effective action in four dimensions? Is yes. there such a relation? No. F terms are in two dimensions. 
but it's anomaly, uh, the Leibniz genus in four dimensions, which in itself has no manifestation in terms of F terms. It's exactly like in six dimensions. In four dimensions, you have the n equal to prepotential, part of which becomes the elliptic genus in six dimensions, but the elliptic genus is not a physical quantity. Uh, it's a quantity which is integrated to, to, to produce an anomaly canceling term, but this as a function itself does not appear as function in, 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 in this mm -hmm. dimensional theory. But in two dimensions, like in type two and Calabria of four, it would, it would compute some terms in the low energy effective action, at least if that was defined. Yeah. If you just take, take type, two, type two A and the fourfold, then you get just two dimensional prepotentials. What's the meaning of a prepotential in two, in two dimensions? All the same. You can, you can just take derivative and, and compute uh, holomorphic correlation functions. It, one should say the following. I mean, in, in four dimensions, these prepotentials are essentially gauge couplings. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe a space, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so one term is the prepotential is, is the complexified gauge coupling. In two dimensions is a complexified phi Heliopoulos coupling. I see. So, Wolfgang, can you give us an intuitive picture of how this minus two weight turns up on, on fluxes? I'm very used to fluxes getting minus one weight, but but, but why minus two? Why minus two weight? <clears throat> Not sure how, uh, how how the question is meant. Well, in the you sense of weight, is weight, is weight five or something. Is that, are you asking a question analogous to why is the main, uh, weight five? No, I mean you know when you look at the transformation of a theta function, the the new the the flux factor, or the, the the character parameter gets a weight of minus one because the volume form there's a volume of the torus to be divided out. Yeah. So so is there an analogous story there? Why these elliptic genera or these these modular anomaly terms involve weight giving weight to minus two to a flux? It seems very non-canonical. Okay, I, 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 I think what you're aiming for. Um, first of all, this diagram tells you again how derivative acts act, yeah? And it's compatible, of course, with the modular weight of Z being one and, and ah, okay. d tau is two. Yeah? And e, the E's go in the other directions. Okay. Then, then probably you, you ask a question, really ask a question which also puzzled us for a longer time. Namely, if you think in terms of supergravity and flux, then you can put modular transformations. And then you could ask, uh, okay, what happens if it could transform them? Mm -hmm. And also, um, how can it be that the effective Lagrangian in four dimensions, uh, in two dimensions, can have pieces with different modular weights? Because yeah. they could have one modular weight. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the thing is that we consider only. Um, well, in general, all quantities like periods or prepotentials have classical pieces plus quantum pieces. And this modular weight is in the sense of Jacobi form refers to this uh, instanton piece. Uh, now the real, the real physical objects have actually the classical pieces like, like, like for a Calabiao, um, Calabiao a period you would uh, say for a Calabiao coupling, you would say, um, it goes with T square, so it's log Q square plus instanton piece. Uh, okay. But these logs transform, of course. Uh, log Q square is tau square or T square, they transform. So if you consider really um, really the duality group acting on, on the period vector, yeah, um, you really need to group these instanton terms together with the classical pieces, and then the whole thing transforms uniformly. And if you write down the effective Lagrangian two dimension in this form, then it's modular invariant, of course. Okay. So it arranges in a way. So you need the classical pieces in addition, and then you must make some kind of inner product, typically flux times period vector, and the, tot the total thing transforms then uniformly with the right weight. But sorry, this is a bit difficult to explain without black force. Okay, well, Stam was waiting for a long time, so. Maybe you can go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a question related to what I think we, you mentioned somewhere at the beginning of your talk, uh, where you, re you related the holomorphic anomalies to non-compact 
parts. It, it's something non-compact manifold. I was just wondering whether you could elaborate on that. Um, non-compact in the sense of zero modes. Um, oh, no, no, no. Where was this? No. Uh, no. Because up to that point, manifolds were all seen compact, and then suddenly a non-compact. Uh, yeah. Well, non-compact means sort of continuous spectrum. It's 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 what's referring to this figure on the right, on the down right. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you put an M five brain between two M nine brains, and mm -hmm. consider the heterotic string as a stretching from one end of the world to the other one, if you have this M five brain, it can it can uh, intersect it, it can uh, connect to it. And then you have a degree of freedom where it can sort of split into two pieces and they can separate, namely into two E strings. And so there is a sort of flat direction between these two E strings along the five brain, which is sort of a continuous, uh, it has no potential as a flat direction. Yeah. Why does that lead to a holomorphic phenomenon? That leads to non holomorphic zero modes. Oh, I see. Because they can. It's in tau piece. Mm -hmm. At least this is my understanding of it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> is there a similar understanding of these new anomalies? Uh, this was a question we I, I tried to yeah, I know. at the end, but to do it properly would require uh, a work in, in, in this, uh, what Boris mentioned, in, mm -hmm. uh, on the level of, of these people, where one really would start rigorously analyzing a two dimensional theory in, in the geometry and see precisely where. It, where the where the zeromos are coming from, and this is here flux induced, which is anyway a bit murky. So we had here more a geometric way, which sort of is laid out in, in the speculative end of our paper, that you dualize the flux into a five brain and and then try to make analogous arguments. Namely, that five brains have intrinsically to do with this kind of phenomena. Um, I would know how to do this for the real flux background. Is it a toy example of where fluxes give rise to flat moduli that might amount to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's, there's a sort of the fluxes are geometric, mm -hmm. so everything should have a geometric um, type of interpretation, and somehow, somehow there should be a flat direction where something can slide along something. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Is it possible, therefore, to cancel it by what could be the boundary conditions that one would need to impose? So to cancel this anomaly that then is due to the to the, to the, to the flat direction would be would, would these be the e brains that you talked about or would be for additional e brains? Not sure what to say here. Yeah. Because it could be completely wrong. Yeah. There must be something in this direction. Some some degenerating geometry and um, so the old old case was was relatively simple. Um, uh, the middle term, uh, and and then it sort of it already shows in your, with your naked eye how, how an heterotic string which corresponds to the curve C beta would split into two curves which basically go to E strings. On on the right hand side, there's this gravitational descent, and actually this can be further evaluated yeah, because correlation function with gravitational descendants are related by water identities to, to other ones without gravitational descent. And it, it will generate another quadratic term plus more stuff. But this quadratic term is, is in, 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 in a linear term in disguise, if you look. And um, so from this point of view, you see also somehow this, uh, well, this, well, this, is, this is what was, what, what, this is what must underlie all, all this story from this point of view. But um, we can't really make a, a connection to, um, to this question of non holomorphicity in, in a better way, in the sense of zero modes. Yeah, this is outside of the scope of this computation. It simply just tells that if you take an anti holomorphic derivative of these correlation functions, you get uh, these extra terms. And then the question is how do you translate these, these two dimensional pictures into a space time picture uh, that, that should make contact with the other? space-time consideration, yeah, so, so, 
so this extra flat direction emerges at a fixed value of the a discrete value of the flux, or is it associated with just any value of the flux? <clears throat> This is a purely geometric thing, so it just should matter what uh, classes these fluxes are in. Yeah. So whenever you have a two-two flux, uh, then then it co co corresponds to certain differential forms sitting on on this color VO, and and that should that should be all what is needed. But, uh, I can imagine that you know when you calculate the geometric superpotential, you would need some critical value of a flux in order to expose a new flat direction or something like that in that superpotential. Yeah. So that's why you know this this flux comes with a coefficient, which is presumably some modulus you can dial. Yeah, and... yeah, there must be some yeah some flat direction somehow, mm -hmm. but uh, that that was beyond this scope. <laughs> Okay, um, Andrea, you want to make a question or you have a video on for a while? I don't know if you intended to make a question. No, okay. Elias was around.